good evening everyone and uh, welcome to today evening's panel discussion on mental health issues related to the lgbtq plus community we have an enterprising panel of uh, five members uh, i will first start by introducing uh, our guests then i will go to our very own psychiatrists who are part of the panel uh, my first guest for the evening is Dr. Prasad Raj Dandekar. Dr. Prasad Dandekar is a leading oncologist by profession and he heads the Radiation Oncology Department at the Sir H. N. Reliance Foundation Hospital. He's also a certified professional coach internationally and he coaches members of the LGBTQ plus community when it comes to building resilience and uh, other areas. He started an association known as the Health Professionals for queer Indians, which is an initiative for to sensitize healthcare professionals towards members of the community. He's a co-founder of the Seniors Group, which is a support group for gay men about the age of 50. He, of course, is a most sought after speaker in oncology, LGBTQ plus and mental health conferences. Uh, most importantly, he's my MBBS batchmate, and it's a pleasure to have him here. Uh, we have with us uh, just a minute i have to juggle between two devices yeah uh, we have with us palav 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 patankar who um, is currently the director of uh, partnerships of avigen india private limited avigen focuses on technology innovations in the healthcare space he's a director of economics a diversity hiring organization and served as the executive board member of the Hamsafa trust and the director of programs there he's also been a board member of the asia pacific Co coalition of male sexual health and director of marketing of the kashish mumbai international queer film festival he holds a master's degree in biotechnology and a postgraduate diploma in international business from the reputed SPJ Institute of Management and Research. He served as a country head uh, in Francophone Africa in the Central African region. He's co-author of a book titled A People Stronger, The Collectivization of MSM and Transgender Groups in India and co-author of a World Bank study called Charting a Programmatic, Programmatic Roadmap for Sexual Minority Groups in India. He spearheads an initiative called Queer and Political that discusses the queer identity as a political identity. And he's a fellow of the famous five class of Ananta Aspen's Kamal Nayan Bajaj Fellowship and the Aspen Global Leadership. Fun facts, he's a part of a documentary 365 without 367 and a concept film called Urmi where he's acted as a man in transition. So we have someone who is from the leadership area, business area, and also an actor. Welcome Palav to today's uh, discussion. Uh, uh, one minute. My third uh, panelist, uh, who's also our guest here today is uh, Nishta. Nishta Nishant is a young trans woman and a human rights activist. She's professionally a scientific researcher, educator, and a counselor. She's currently working as a scientific assistant at Lilac, Lilac Insights, Navi Mumbai. She calls herself a survivor of gender-based discrimination, and she's won several awards, especially being the best speaker. She's been invited as a resource person at renowned organizations to speak about special techniques in science and to spread awareness about the LGBTQI plus community. She's guided several students in schools and colleges for their projects and has been volunteering for several social causes. Besides all this, she loves to cycle around the city, travel, cook, dance and enjoy herself. Well, welcome Nishta to this panel. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, now we have, of course, our two mental health professionals, uh, Dr. Jyoti Shetty, madam, who's with us uh, all the way from uh, Pune. Uh, madam is the professor and uh, head of the department of uh, the Department of Psychiatry at the Bharati Vidyapit Research Center and Deemed University Medical College, Pune. Uh, she has also been part of the Child Psychiatry Committee of IPS 2015-2016 forensic psychiatry and law subspeciality 2019-2020-2021. And uh, she's currently the co-chairperson of the Indian Psychiatric Society Perinatal Psychiatry Task Force. She is the vice president of the Pune Psychiatric Association. And uh, she has been a past president of the Indian Psychiatric Society Pune branch. Uh, Madam has always been doing uh, 
a lot of work in this area and i think their department is one of the departments which is friendly with regard to the lgbtq plus community when pay people seek mental health issues and i think they even have a specialized opd to help these people so welcome ma'am on the show uh, my last panelist for today is our very own dr cheryl john uh, our treasurer of bombay psychiatric society that's but beyond that she's a consultant psychiatrist she has uh, at the hiranandani hospital and holy spirit hospital mumbai uh, she's very active in various areas she's even working with uh, the church for various initiatives uh, most importantly she's our go to person she's always available when we uh, need a resource person or a panelist for any program and she never says no so uh, welcome cheryl you're at home but still we have to introduce you so uh, welcome to today's panel what i'm going to do is we have a series of questions which are general questions which i think i will run through the panelists uh, we will start with hearing the views of our guests so we'll start with prasad then pallav and nishtha and then jyoti and sheril uh, and then you know we'll if there are any specific questions i want to direct towards specific people and uh, the audience would uh, be requested to keep themselves mute you could type out uh, your answers in the, uh, type out your questions in the chat box and i would take up those questions as and when in the middle of the panel so uh, we start with you uh, prasad and uh, one of the things which uh, uh, i wanted to ask you and i think that's the main crux of our uh, panel discussion here today is uh, what according to you are the main uh, mental health issues noted within persons that belong to the lgbtqi plus community so the mental health issues that we see in the lgbtq community are not uh, very different from what we see in the population so it's not that the lgbtq community is at a higher risk of certain mental health issues uh, we see the same issues such as anxiety depression suicidal attempts um, and and the whole spectrum of it but what we uh, notice and we have enough uh, research unfortunately not from india but from outside which shows that the lgbtq community is at a higher risk of mental health problems and that is not because they are lgbtq uh, community members but that is because they are marginalized and they are discriminated so it is a part of the minority stress that causes uh, these issues that uh, there is uh, there is no space for them to uh, express themselves so Uh, this morning for example i was with a friend of mine who's uh, who's from a smaller town in mumbai uh, in, in uh, maharashtra and uh, is being pressurized for marriage by his family members and he reached out to me saying that can i take my parents to a psychiatrist to explain them because he has tried everything that has happened and this is now causing him uh, sleepless nights anxiety uh, he's uh, on on you know has been diagnosed with borderline depression um, so otherwise he's a fit young man He's 25 years old. He's a very well-educated, intelligent man. But just because this is happening to him, he is landing up with mental health issues. So uh, the the fundamental issue here is the uh, discrimination and marginalization that the community faces. Yes. Uh, over to you, Pallav. Yeah. Your thoughts. Yeah. So I I have seen the whole space from a programmatic lens uh, because I used to be the director of programs of the Hamsa for Trust. We ran HIV programs uh, across five states uh, at a point in time with multiple community-based organizations. And if you were to and just to take forth what uh, Dr. Prasad just mentioned, you know there are two terminologies which we use in programmatic languages: stigma and discrimination. And this whole point of stigma and discrimination so deeply embedded in the whole psyche of uh, your sexuality as you are growing up and it starts off early it's when you are 12 13 at your most vulnerable stage and the adolescent stage is you know a, a vulnerable for everybody and more so if you are uh, in an environment which is uh, you know constantly you are exposed to bullying you are exposed to uh, you know name calling and uh, you are exposed to even uh, unfortunately india taking the career decisions at this time you know you you branch out into your medicine or your engineering or you know take career decisions whether you want to take b com so i think what happens to uh, a person from the lgbt community is you're constantly under pressure and this build up of anxiety you know depression or the feeling of being second or being less is something which is which kind of actually culminates and breaks into you when you are in your mid 20s and in your late 30s where it 
you can't take it anymore and then it is manifesting itself into depression and it is man and we also notice that because of the stigma and discrimination and because what we say that the enabling environment is missing you are not really taking care of yourself your health decisions your you know personal opinion about uh, you know taking care of yourself exposes you to various dangers be it hiv be it you know just taking care of your general health uh you know your weight your diet your uh you know general well being and i think it matters. so i feel that uh let's address where this begins this begins very early in our adolescence and uh you know unfortunately gender sexuality is not something that you can address below 18 without a guardian in our country right now and that is the time where i feel that we do need to have educators uh you know along with psychiatric health professionals who are able to be sensitive at this point in time and you know kind of nip it in the bud and i think also a larger social change which is required because these manifestations what we are seeing is what can be stopped at a much earlier stage so i would like to kind of put that out there sure nishta over to you uh sure thank you so much well i will definitely agree with palav and dr uh, prasad what they have mentioned um we have always learned from our schooling days that the definition of family is restricted to only a man and a woman and their child if you find someone who is effeminate uh, especially somebody who is biologically born as a male we would try to throw them away from the so called mainstream society and due to the stigma and the taboo that we 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 are born and brought up with we end up succumbing to a lot of mental health issues which most of us are not even aware people lack information people lack terminologies or vocabulary to even communicate with some other human being seeking for help uh, a lot of them get involved into substance use and abuse specifically in in the hope of um, you know uh becoming someone that they want to be or they try to adjust or accommodate themselves uh in 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 side or other within the binaries that is uh the male or a female well all of this is because of the societal pressure a uh, lack of acceptance lack of acceptance from their very own families uh the the place that they belong to uh they are forced to leave those places and seek for support from their family of choices well as i mentioned that there is a lot of awareness that needs to be created and there's lack of information about the community too a lot of them experience phobia within the space that they exist it may not necessarily be the safe space that they want to belong to uh it leads to a lot of anxiety issues or disorders uh major depression issues as well and there are a lot of people who attempt or ideate suicide well it is very important to know that people have certain experiences or certain situations force them to push to these ends where they end up taking certain steps which are not very fruitful for them i feel it is only possible if we start identifying the root cause educate the right time instead of waiting for you know the adult age uh for people to know about the community speak about the issues speak about people who very much exist as a part of society and not treat us as strange as queer is defined in the dictionary thank you okay thank you so much uh we now move to dr shetty ma'am from your experience in you know managing people who come to you for help what would you like to say about mental health issues related to the community uh the mental health issues what we usually see is depression anxiety and uh, since we have a, a memorandum of understanding with uh, mr khire's organization so what they usually come for is the primary counseling you they refer for either coming out to your their parents or being comfortable with their you know their orientation their identity uh, we also do a lot of work in terms of uh, gender dysphoria for the uh, gender affirmation interventions so what we have seen is that obviously i mean as studies reported and as all the previous speakers said there's a lot of depression there's a lot of anxiety what we have seen is not so much of substance use disorders though it's reported in the literature but definitely depression and also self harm so not only ideating but most of them have had at least uh, one attempt of uh, self harm if not more 
so that is something that is then as it was you know as the discussion started with you know stigma and discrimination being a uh, you know major contributor obviously one of the primary contributors to it apart from that what happens is uh, what we see is you know like uh, what is noted in literature that uh, and uh, a member from the lgbt community with mental illness will have a dual sort of alienation so it is not only in the mental illness which again creates has its own st uh, stigma in terms of society's acceptance and it is also uh, being from the minority uh, sexual minority community so these right. are two aspects which again come in right thank you ma'am uh, sheril over to you your your take yeah yeah you know i agree with all my uh, previous speakers who mentioned about you know like i i like what prasad said about uh, the if you actually look at from the neurological or the brain point of view uh, the brain of a heterosexual and somebody belongs to the community is the same what causes the difference is this added on stressor so there is something known as a minority stress theory you know because of stigma prejudice discrimination violence the added on stressor causes definitely an increased prevalence of psychiatric disorders in the community so we definitely see more cases of depression more cases of anxiety uh, substance use disorders like you know nishita said that just to numb yourself or to kind of get rid of the discomfort that you're feeling you don't know how to reach out for help uh, a number of suicidal attempts i mean it's almost four times as compared to the general population Uh, another thing that we notice is domestic violence and being victims of that and the aftermath of the violence so violence in the family uh, sometimes violence in intimate partner relationships and the implications of that on mental health so uh, this is what we see we definitely see the increase uh, in these cases sure uh i now move back uh, to prasad and we move from this introduction to something which is very relevant because i think i've had a number of patients that have very often come to me and spoken spoken to me about coming out and how important it is and so i would you know want to ask you prasad that the first thing is that you know uh this could be your personal take you could give us a theoretical take whatever you like uh how important is coming out one and if you do come out you know people always tell me you know so what would be the right time is there a particular way are there steps to follow so your take yeah so i feel coming out is important but it is an uh, absolutely individual decision to come out uh, first of all this entire concept of coming out is is almost inhuman that you have to hide yourself in the closet and then you have to fight uh, itself fight it with yourself and the entire world outside to then gradually try to come out uh, i personally feel my per personal take is that coming out is a huge huge benefit it it set me free it literally set me free when i came out uh, my first coming out was when i was hardly 16 years old when i came out to my closest friend and his unconditional acceptance is what made me today i'm here in this panel probably because he just accepted me for who i am because it just set me free however say uh, saying that you have to be very very careful when you're coming out and as a mental health professional uh, you need to be careful when you're advising people to come out it is important to consider is the time right are you financially independent uh, suppose if the family throws you out of the house what are you going to do are you financially independent do you have any allies in the family you need to have a network of people who will hold you if you fall down so whether they could be family members your cousins your you know siblings uh, they could be close friends uh, uncles aunts whatever thirdly whom are you trying to come out to are they ready to hear that say for example if you're trying to come out to your parents and you feel they are at an absolute homophobia end then maybe it is not the right time to come out you need to sort of work on them soften them up and then come out and uh, uh, also you need to have a uh, support structure built for people whom you are coming out to say for example if you are coming out to your parents and you expect something to go wrong then you need to have you know some family members who will support you maybe a counselor maybe a psychiatric uh, psychiatrist on hold uh, just in case if there is a problem so while coming out is useful and i recommend it but it is a highly individualistic decision 
and do remember that coming out is not one day or one you know one time we keep coming out throughout our life to different people so uh, don't rush into it think and then plan and come out a plan coming out is infinitely better than an impromptu coming out right uh, pallav your thoughts so i couldn't agree more than what uh, uh, dr prasad just said i mean everything applies i i have seen uh, while my at my work my at my hamza where i've seen uh, coming out which have been good and i've seen people bloom in the process of coming up and i have seen disasters also you know in the sense where uh, like prasad said if the coming out is not planned and if it is a cry for help at, with the family when the family is not ready for it then there has been a huge crisis at the family level where then you have to involve family counseling you have to bring in the mother which is which is not the same as some where you have worked it out but i think before coming out Uh, i think the first step is coming out to yourself i mean have you accepted yourself about and your own sexuality you know i mean and you need to be really comfortable in your own skin and you need to be uh, you need to say that this is who i am i mean and just like prasad uh, spoke about 16 i think i was at the same age around 16 17 18 it took me 2 years to actually say and accept the fact that i was gay i mean and this i'm talking in the 90s when there was very little discourse i think today the good thing is that there is material and there is enough of a conversation which is happening which is a good thing but way back in the 90s we didn't have many resources i think ashok is out there and ashok and bombay dost in the 90s were the only material available to somebody like me at that point in time to actually go to and uh, having said that uh, you know a lot of people have come and asked me should i come out in my office today we have diversity and inclusion agendas and you know organizations and companies doing this whole lgbt support thing and people will say oh, should i come out to my colleagues and should i come out to my my workplace and i'm like listen it is not as if you're going to come out at your workplace and go back into the closet tomorrow because you change your company or the organization once you are out you are out to the industry and you are out to everybody and it is not like you can decide to go back in the closet tomorrow so the planning and the need for being you know knowing that it is an irreversible step needs to be kept very clear in your head uh, you need a very good support structure and here you know uh, the whole uh, how what is your support structure becomes extremely essential either it's your family it's your set of friends it could even be your colleagues who are there to kind of you know take up and i think that preparation and creating of that support structure becomes essential and in the community we sometimes say my family my support family or my alternate family you know it is your set of lgbt your allies uh, and everyone who is there to hold your hand and support you if anything goes wrong and that is extremely essential really all right uh, nishta your take well i would definitely second dr uh, prasad as well as pallav to what they have mentioned but i would want to add certain points uh, can we ask everyone to have go on mute please priyanka just Hi. check yeah just i'll unmute one second sure i know i know just just mute chicken i know grilled chicken chicken gravy and all yeah i'm hungry now Parker <laughs> is cooking tonight chicken. Okay. <laughs> That was with eggs. I make with the. Uh... Okay. Yeah. So I would like to add that uh, coming out would be a different experience for different individuals. Uh, since I identify myself as a transgender person, and I was not very well equipped with uh, the queer community and the terminologies, I was coming out at different times and different phases. and now when i connect to those days i can also connect to the current scenario where people identify themselves as gender fluid or queer or non binary for that matter so it is very important for one to first understand a little more about the queer community because when you come out of the closet to maybe your loved ones uh, there may be certain questions which would be raised and one needs to know a little to address those questions in an appropriate way if you do not find yourself uh, to be capable enough to explain uh, about the queer community see to it that you have somebody from the community along with you who could be your ally and who could be 
your family of choice um, and help you address those questions in an appropriate way. I also recommend to uh, ensure that you create a safe space for yourself. Well, of course, uh, with addition to your financial independency, identifying your family of choice, you may be capable of identifying a safe space for you, but ensure that you first accept yourself like Pallav mentioned and then come out to whoever you want to. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Dr. Shetty, Madam, uh, this question is more as a psychiatrist and I'm asking you this because we very often get people who come to us and say that, you know, I want to disclose to my parents or I want to disclose to uh, my family members and they would want to do it in a session with you being, you know, yeah. present because they feel a little secure and they feel a little more confident. So yeah. in, in such cases, I mean, where they want to do it, I mean, what is the kind of approach that, you know, you would follow? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, we get quite a few uh, individuals who do come for this prime reason, actually. Uh, they are probably very comfortable with their identity, with their orientation. Um, they have probably also come out to their friends, actually, so they have shared uh, their orientation. It's just with the immediate family, I think, becomes the last uh, sometimes to know, especially in our society. And uh, more than two years back, I think it was even worse, actually. So. Uh, what we get is like, you know, they would probably come initially with a friend and, you know, speak about how one partner has come out to the family and the other partner has not. And uh, how to do it because, you know, the plans may be of probably moving in together and then, you know, uh, being seen as friends, just, you know, uh, cohabiting, but then uh, obviously wanting to be much more transparent about the relationship. So this happens quite often. So what we usually do is uh, what... I do personally is like we ask them to, you know, sort of inform us where they have, they have come out with one of their family members, probably a sibling, maybe a cousin who they are very close to, who may be of the similar age. Uh, it helps because the relationship also, you know, depending on how close they are, if they've come out to one of their relatives, then probably having that individual also coming with the parents because, you know, parents, sometimes probably the mother or the father, probably are the toughest ones to break uh, you know or come out to so you know to even sort of come and tell them probably there will be a lot of inhibitions so we ask them to come in fact we initially what i do is i ask them to come with that cousin or the sibling who they are comfortable with so that we can go out and go through a process of how to go about inviting or asking the parents to come so uh, it is always preferable if they do the job by themselves, probably in the, I mean, if they are comfortable, probably, you know, with the cousin or the cousin says that, okay, this is something that I can also address with initially with the parents. That is a one step. Otherwise, what we do is we have them all come to the clinic and then uh, open up the conversation about how they see, because uh, what I found is that most parents, at least one of them may have an inkling they may not actually talk about it or it's something that is swept under the carpet, but they may have an inkling about it, uh, though they don't want to address it overtly. So usually it is, you know, individually when I see the one of the parents, I al always ask them what their opinion is, how they see it, and uh, what is it that they think that the individual has come to talk about. And uh, then we bring up the conversation about, generally speaking about, you know, what is identity, what is orientation, and uh, I always invite actually the ind individual if they would like to talk because that is something because ultimately they have to go to the same house, you know, and uh, live with that uh, family member. So then, you know, if they feel safer in the clinic with us around, but if they wish to talk, we ask them to talk, of course. And uh, with the, you know, if there's a, another family member who's obviously the ally, uh, you know, uh, being included in that conversation, so they can start and then after some time what we have seen i mean what i see i think is something that all of us see actually in the clinic one or the other parent will probably have a lot of distress you know initial a lot of denial and uh, that uh, when, when we identify that that is a person who needs to you know sort of probably have some more time independently individually that is what i do i you know sort of allow them to take some time then come back alone and speak to them at length about what the queries are, what their understanding is, 
and of course allow them to also ventilate their own distress because that is something that we have to do you know hand hold with right. one or the other parent right well well thank you uh, well uh, cheryl anything you would like to add and then i have a question from the audience also for you yeah so uh, no i i think that everybody has kind of you know covered like we said but the most important thing i'd really like for prasad said is about self awareness right because that that's the most important coming out especially as you're crossing the adolescent age uh the confusion you know why am i feeling this way because you're living in a heterosexual normal world and you're kind of getting confused why am i feeling this way is this normal uh, you know all the confusion you're feeling inside and the moment you acknowledge become aware you come out yourself i think that sets you free and you integrate all the different parts of yourself and this coming out definitely is a long process uh, i see a lot of uh, my club patients who say that you know they prefer to come out only to their community that is lgbtq plus community they do not want to come out to the family and that's a good support system uh, i think there may be a lot of parents who are listening and i really feel that you know as parents of of young children we always want to give them that you know self confidence or uh, build up their self esteem as a parent and when my child is comfortable as an individual he should also be comfortable irrespective of his sexual orientation to come back to me and talk to me about their problems so as parents we really need to uh, you know be there for our children irrespective of the sexual orientation just so that's what i want yes uh well this is a question which i will address to uh, you now cheryl and uh, so it will not be that we're always coming to you last and then of course uh, uh pallav i would want your take also on this someone has asked you know is there something we can do to normalize being gay because i'm open to my immediate family and friends but it kills me that i can't be open to my relatives and digitally i have taken steps to open out but i hope they go well but i'm very scared about my parents having saying something after i post something and i'm mentally stressed so cheryl first your take and then pallav yeah uh, this is a very common narrative yeah. right and i i see so many of like i said i recently there was this uh, gentleman i was seeing online and he was talking about like you know his parents knew they're from a very elite and you know educated family so they accepted all that they accept his partner and everything but when it comes to family they are like okay ab shaadi karo right because you can do what you want but you just get married so that our relatives don't find out about this orientation and um, i think that what we as a community or this is a societal problem right it's not an individual problem we have to change this conformity that we put only as heterosexual as normal and kind of work hard in making people realize there are people of different orientations gender you know uh, fluidity which is another ch- girl who came to me and said i myself am not sure and how do i talk to my family so that is i think our role as a society to normalize different orientations and we all need to work really hard starting right from school i think when we address young children in school and we talk about you know sex only as boy and girl we need to kind of make them aware about the other orientations too so we start early and i think by the time the generations build up we will see a society where everything is normal right uh yes pallav so uh okay let's start with uh you know the using the term normalizing i mean uh, first of all i I, yeah. i don't understand it anymore but uh but let i think i'll give a little bit of a personal perspective you know i was coming from a very corporate uh, space and i was out to family everything was fine and hunky dory but uh, of course my uh, my mother and she was a single mother raising me uh, was not of the opinion that i should be going and talking about it to everyone because obviously all parents say uh, they won't understand it the way i do you know and of course i was uh, uh, then the director programs at hamsafar and you have to go into the media and speak and uh, talk uh, you know in section 377 a lot of issues were going around so i used to end up being on television and i think that was the biggest normalization because i didn't bother going and telling my extended set of relatives anything about it they saw me on tv speaking about it and i was speaking about it very seriously with facts figures and uh, you know uh, a matter of factly that when we met in person 
I really did not have to come out to them as gay. They said, hey, you know, we saw you that day, you know, probably talking about it. Or, and if to extend it to what you're saying, uh, you know, uh, they are seeing my posts on Facebook and that I support, uh, you know, the queer community. And sometimes they say, I like the work that you're doing for these people. And I usually say, these people is me. That's who I am. I mean, like, I'm not working for these people. You know, and you own up and you actually kind of, uh, it is interesting how I really needed, not needed to come out to people within the building that I live in or my extended set of families because I normalized it for them. I kind of started speaking about my work or what I do or what I feel in a very normal way that I did not make it, uh, you know, hush who, by the way, I am gay. You know, I normalized it and that's why it didn't become dirty. It becomes dirty when you want to hide it and feel dirty about it. And that's why the, you know, the, the first thing which I said is, are you comfortable with yourself about who you are? Because then the way you put it forth is a matter of fact, yeah, this is who I am. And I think people appreciate the fact that you are being your authentic self and not hiding behind. Yeah, I am. Yes, okay. Uh, now I have uh, uh, two things. One is, of course, we have a wonderful panel here. You all have all been very wonderful uh, so far. There's a request from the audience that we should have a panel discussion of this caliber in Hindi as well. So we will definitely have it in the future. And I plan to have all of you back again, but the same thing, but in Hindi. So uh, I will definitely do this in my tenure as Bombay Psychiatric Society president. That's a promise. Uh, now, a question for uh, Jyoti Shetty, ma'am, and Prasad. Uh, we have a question that very often same sex couples come in for counseling where one plays a male role and one plays a female role are there any general pointers when it comes to counseling uh, you know such couples in uh, an office based practice so you know what should we do should we not do jyoti ma'am first and yeah. then prasadya yeah. yeah fine i've had such a couple and then uh, what i have found i mean when they come most of the issues are the same i mean you know if it is an interpersonal conflict that they have uh, irrespective of uh, who's taking the role of what, uh, you know, which uh, gender in, in that sense, it does not really matter. It, it becomes like, you know, it could be very, frankly, sometimes it is, you know, very mundane stuff uh, related to roles, you know, whether it's in the kitchen or whether it is something that is not done and then that just builds up. So a lot of issues that come are mundane day-to-day -day things. And that may just build up, as I said, uh, largely not to do with the role that they take. I mean, so then probably, you know, the sexual activity and the role they take in bed really doesn't come into it. It could be something to do with, you know, personal hygiene, you know, something to do with uh, very, you know, normal. I think even any heteronormative couple would probably also be facing these issues. So in that sense, I would say that it is the counseling would go on the same lines. It would be right. about, you know, the aggression and the, you know, allow one individual. In fact, you feel that one individual is having much of a more of a stress, probably having some individual sessions with that individual anyway. But as such, I do not, uh, you know, really see too much of a difference in terms of, uh, as you said, you know, the positions that oh. they take. Oh. Prasad. So this is a very common question that we get, uh, me and my partner. So which one of you is female? And my answer to that, it depends on which room we are in, in the house. Because uh, this heteronormative thing of the woman should cook and women, woman should, uh, the person who uh, is taking a receptive position in the sexual act is the woman, is again a heteronormative thing. Um, the way I look at it is there are no uh, roles taken here. There are no women in this relationship. And that is the whole point. Uh, you may ascribe certain activities that you do to a certain gender uh, role and that's about it that you know like I, I like cooking and I may like doing something else and I may like you know so it doesn't work that way and as Dr. Shet Shetty said it is finally boiling down to two individuals uh, living together and trying not to kill each other it, it really boils down to that 
So I have had uh, counseling sessions with various psychiatrists, counselors. I mean, I've been with my partner for 17 years and we are still alive. So you can imagine the amount of work that goes in and the issues are the same. Uh, of course, the only thing that is essential in this from mental health uh, professional perspective is that the mental health professional needs to be uh, aware of what we are getting into. I have had one very strange incident where me and my partner went to a particular psychiatrist, I think this was around 8 to 10 years ago, and she had absolutely no idea what we were talking about. And she was a very sweet girl. She said, you know, Dr. Prasad, I have no idea. So me and my partner actually sat down there and educated her for two hours about LGBT community while we had actually gone her to help. Uh, so that is an important thing and initiatives such as this that the uh, psychiatric societies across India are now taking are achieving that, that we are educating the mental health professionals to sensitize to these issues. But, you know, I totally agree with Dr. Shetty. It finally comes down to two people coming together. Right. Uh, well, uh, Nishta, there's a question for you from the audience, which I'll ask. And I think uh, uh, it's a very clear question that and I'll give you my personal take on this also. Uh, why are people hostile, you know, when they see people with pronouns? Why are they reluctant in using pronouns for that matter? And since you've done a lot of work in the area of stigma and, you know, overcoming stigma rather and discrimination, your take. Yeah. Well, I genuinely believe that we are living in a society where we are already preconditioned with addressing uh, people with gender pronouns that belong to the gender binary, that is male and female. So if you see a woman or somebody who is dress, dressed in a women's wear, we would address them as she or her, or the otherwise we would say he or him. But we have never been equipped with addressing people with gender neutral pronouns, like they or them. And it really matters to the person who identifies themselves as gender queer or non-binary that the pronouns that they want have to be used or addressed. It is out of love and respect that one would do. It, it may not necessarily be that, you know, the person wants to identify themselves within the gender binary. So it is very much important to ask someone if they appear to be or they are queer or if they want to have any specific preferences in terms of uh, being addressed with their desired name or with their desired gender pronouns. It is our responsibility or rather the onus is on us to respect and address them with the preferred name and the pronouns. Uh, well, it wasn't very easy while I was transitioning for people to understand the importance of gender pronouns that were supposed to be used for me. But it was my responsibility to ensure that I would educate them, make them understand that how these mental uh, health issues arise due to inappropriate usage of gender pronouns or uh, misgendering or uh, miscalling me by my dead name or my previous name. and it is no good for me and there might be implications which may not be good for anyone. So helping people know about what is my requirement in the beginning was my responsibility. By now people are equipped with understanding things but there would be one person out of the many who would still not adapt to the change. For such people, I believe that giving them their own space away from me, that is distancing from them, is healthier for my own mental health. And I, I still focus on this particular aspect that if somebody doesn't know about our identity, or if somebody doesn't know about our gender pronouns, it's always better to ask, educate, and keep them well informed so that we do not have any bitter experiences moving forward when there is any interaction or when, when there is any uh, you know, <clears throat> communication between the two of us. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I will just add here, I always remember when this whole issue, when I was new to working with the LGBTQ plus community, I had no idea about pronouns and the use of pronouns and I remember I went in for a seminar and you know somebody asked me you know sir what are your preferred pronouns and I really didn't know what to say I mean it was uh, and I actually had to tell him that I'm sorry I'm not aware so they felt no but I mean you know what would you like to be and 
for me i mean it was like it's obviously he and you know i didn't know that you know and then it was someone who explained to me over there and that's when i learned and now when i meet people i often ask them you know how would you like me to say address you or what would you want me to say and you know that's how sensitization sort of came in uh, someone has asked us whether we should have a mandatory training session for doctors in medical colleges to make them understand how to you know address these issues i think we should i think prasad and his team had done a session like this at sain hospital for medical students and medical doctors and i think in the post covid scenario once we get back to physical meetings we'll definitely want to do this even now in the online uh, setting we can definitely probably do this so there would no be, not be an issue been, yes we have been doing it we have been doing yes yes please 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 yeah so uh, the uh, education of doctors is very important and we realized a uh, few years ago uh, i personally faced a uh, uh, horrific homophobic incidents from a colleague of mine whom i knew for many many years uh, uh, and he abused me online publicly and that really broke me down it took me many days to recover from it and that is what led to formation of the health professional for queer indians and dr avinash is being very modest here but let me uh, remind him that dr avinash and dr karsi chawda were the first uh, people who supported this cause and we held our first uh, conference around 3 years ago Uh, which had more than 750 registrations in just like 2 days and uh, since then we have conducted many conferences across cities and we have in fact utilized the pandemic uh, in a way that now i'm conducting many online webinars so i conducted recently in this pride month itself i did it with aims bhubaneswar next week is stanley hospital stanley college chennai and then is uh, one college in uh, meerut so we are doing that and the amount of enthusiasm Uh, that the medical students have is really encouraging so uh, to the psychiatric community if you know we can organize more of these sessions i think we will be paving way uh, in a long term basis for uh, non discrimination yes uh, madam you wanted to add something doctor uh, yeah, yeah i yeah. wanted to add that not only are we have we been doing that for the past 2 uh, 3 years at the undergraduate level and of course post graduate level we do anyway but uh, the cbme that is you know the competence based medical education system that has come in in the past 2 years it has an atcom model so that is about attitudes ethics and communication so apart from persons with disabilities and how to deal with them lgbt community minorities sexual minorities uh, about talking to them is something that is also included in the curriculum so then of course i don't know how many colleges actually at an individual level go do it in a much more intensive way but then it is something that allows a scope to include it so it's something that starts from the first year on was in front from the foundation uh, you know the course which is the first month of mbbs yeah uh, uh, Dr. well Dr. this is yes. i just wanted to ask since we are on this thing of education i yet wanted to highlight that there are instances of, of you know convergence therapies which we get from time to time in yes. smaller towns not in main cities and i do not know whether there can be any process within your setups to address those issues when it Yes, no, I will because uh, there's a question even asked that very often we visit a psychiatrist or a psychologist with a confusion about our sexual orientation, and they advise us to get married even after telling them that you know all our sexual milestones are towards the same sex. Now, sadly, well, I would say, I mean, I'm you're speaking. for myself more and even as the president of bombay psychiatric society well we i think a large number of our psychiatrists in bombay are very sensitized and you know uh, positive towards though of course we will always have some people who aren't aware and they really don't know or they are probably too old in their thinking you know these things do happen it does happen in smaller towns as well it happens in metros as well leave alone smaller towns so uh, and uh, what i would advise people attending this program is that we have dr jyoti here we have dr sheril here we have all the members of our executive committee of bombay psychiatric society you can look us up on the website uh, i am there prasad is there so you know you need any kind of help just contact us and we'll put you with the right people and that's what i think health professionals for queer in Indians also does it puts you with people who are sensitized so you will not face this problem even we have counselors and therapists who are sensitized so you would not you know face this problem another thing also i would advise all of you is before you consult a psychiatrist please 
call up the psychiatrist and ask him, you know, are you comfortable and do you handle these issues? Because if he is not equipped or he doesn't handle these issues, you might as well go to a professional who can handle them rather than face, you know, the negativity that you sometimes face when you go here. So, but we will, as a society, take it up and try and, you know, sensitize more and more mental health professionals uh, towards this. Definitely. Uh, my question now is uh, uh, to Prasad and, uh, of course, uh, to Nishta and Cheryl, all three of you, uh, with regard to elderly members of the community and, uh, you know, uh, what are the mental health issues? Are there any mental health issues which are specific to them? So uh, one of the initiatives that I run with uh, Ashok Rao Kavi is called Seniors. Uh, which is basically like senior teenagers. Uh, these are this is a support group for uh, gay men about the age of fifty, and uh, the stories that one sees there are quite sometimes heartbreaking. You know, a uh, few months ago, one of the gentlemen who is in his mid seventies told me, "Prasad, I have wasted my life." Now, this is somebody who got married at an early age because of you know fifty years ago uh, uh, he got married and uh, he has lived with depression. Uh, and anxiety and guilt and all of that uh, throughout his life. So we do see a, a lot of uh, mental health issues in these people's life because they are not able to express themselves and not only that they are not able to express themselves but they actually have to express what they are not. So they have to pretend that they you know they are a family man or they have to you know make babies uh, uh, come what may and prove that they are you know heterosexual or man and that leads to a lot of problems uh, many of them have uh, homosexual partners and then the relationship becomes very uh, complex uh, if they uh, come out by mistake or if somebody outs them that leads to a lot of disasters um, on family level financial level uh, before 377 even at a legal level so uh, blackmailing is a huge issue uh, Probably it has come down now because of the 377 gone. But before that, it was a major issue. Some young man would uh, meet you on one of the apps, uh, then come home and then threaten you that he will blackmail you and out you to your employer or to your family, to your wife. So it's a difficult life. And, uh, you know, we are trying to do whatever we can from teenagers' point of view. Yeah. Having said that, even today, younger people in their 20s who are completely aware of their sexuality are getting married to women even today i have people who are in their 30s and 40s are getting married to women because they can't deal with the loneliness that comes with they said i don't mind but you know i just need somebody in the house otherwise i'll kill myself so it's a very complex issue and, uh, you know, I don't know, it will take a while for us to, as a society, to stabilize. Yeah. Shetty, ma'am, uh, your thoughts, uh, sorry, Cheryl, uh, your thoughts? Yeah, so uh, if you're looking from the psychiatry point of view, a lot of research says that, you know, the incidence of mental health issues, uh, if you're talking particularly to the LGBTQ I, you know, plus community is seen in less than 35 years of age and then the second age group is above 55 years of age. And it completely resonates with what Dr. Prasad is saying, right? That you have lived so many years, um, you know, uh, not identifying with who you are. As you grow older, there is a lot of loneliness, isolation, a uh, lot of remorse and regret for what life could have been. Um, Again, the fear of victimization is huge because uh, it's such a hidden life and then a lot of people threatening. A lot of memory and uh, dementia changes that we see sometimes because of the chronic stress has been there for a very long period of time. Sometimes a neurodegeneration starts earlier. So uh, definitely uh, a lot of mental health issues more in above 55 and I think these are the reasons for that. Okay, Nishta, uh, any, any thoughts on elderly? Yeah. So, having not been allowed to be who they are, 
has a lot of effect on their mental health uh, while they progress and while they want to be the true version of themselves a lot of people end up using digital world which is available nowadays a lot of them end up uh, joining dating apps for that matter which uh, connects them to people maybe of similar age or younger age who tend to take an undue advantage of their age particularly and try to exploit them be it sexually or financially it also leads to a lot of anxiety depression and many more other issues or related to mental health uh, i feel it is very important to reach out to mental health professionals trust people around and share rather than allowing things to happen thank you hey, thank you uh, well pallav i have a question for you it's a more of a social issue and then i would ask uh, uh, jyoti ma'am to give her take on this also uh, someone has written that you know because of social pressures they've had to get married though they by you know they didn't want to and they are now struggling of course in that relationship which uh, they are in and also at the same time uh, you can also have a person who is married but he has now come to understand his sexual orientation and uh, he is of course involved with a partner and there's a guilt of cheating on his wife now what would be your advice of course as someone who has you know worked with members at a program level and then of course uh, jyoti ma'am yeah i have dealt with several such situations which have come to me uh, and uh, in most cases uh, we we look at it from a very holistic perspective now just because i'm from the lgbt community doesn't mean that i'm going to see it from the gay man's eyes i feel that here there are two individuals and their lives at stake i have to even see it from the woman's point of view and the fact that she is in a marriage where probably there is you know something that has come in her life which she was unaware of so you have to be fair in that whole situation and usually we do tend we have sat with the gay man and had to explain with the to the gay man that listen you know not only is this not fair to you but it is not fair to the woman and if we are it would so we usually encouraged that if you want to reduce that guilt is to start initiating that conversation sometimes when you are married you may not be aware of your own sexuality and that happens very often not everybody is aware about their sexuality when they are 16 17 the person has also come and said you know i did not know until my first intimate encounter that it was actually men that i liked and you know sometimes they refer to their initial uh, sexual exploits with uh, with men in school or college as something that was experiment uh, as experiments they did not realize that it was their sexuality and they feel that after marriage they realize that don't they are actually gay in most cases we've asked people to address it with the wife in a uh, in the right way and usually then of course like prasad said the legal point comes in if the if they want to continue that marriage they do not wish to continue that marriage and if that marriage has to go its separate ways then what are the rights of the woman as well in that whole space and that is an important conversation as well uh, a lot of times we've had situations where the where the the uh, you know husband has, i mean the the man has come along with his lover and he says can i just have this you know i want to have a divorce with my wife but i please tell me a way how i can cut this short and you know have her thrown out without me having to pay anything and we are like that's not something that's just okay you know be yeah. please understand that she is also suffering because of the stigma discrimination which is heaped on a gay man and the sexuality that it's not just the gay men who end up getting affected it is a larger society which gets affected because this person is in the closet and that is the one of the reasons that if we were to reduce stigma and discrimination it would have been good for the gay man as well as this woman who would have not been in this marriage you know and we need to explain this to this individual and say that please do the right thing in ensuring that she has a future and a life too if this marriage is not going to happen but then that happens to be a counseling as a community member to my community as well in doing the right thing it's not just about you know uh just saying okay now go ahead so i think these are not these are not very easy conversations they become very case specific depending on the situation even depending upon the education level of the woman whether she is financially independent or dependent on the husband and you know they have so usually we also have a lawyer in the room a human rights lawyer who also explains to this so uh, i feel then it goes on a case to case basis but on the whole as a community we 
are not here to uh, you know uh, at the cost of my rights to step on someone else's rights that's not the way human rights work we really need to kind of take it in a stepwise way yeah yeah we have yeah. Uh, had couples like this where i mean the male being a bisexual coming out very late i mean up two children to the wife of course the wife had clinical depression so the index patient was the wife who was brought to us and then it was subsequent interview that uh, revealed what was happening but here again it is not uh, they were very clear that they wanted to stay together irrespective of what the sexual orientation of the husband was both of them desired to stay together and uh, though she was i mean both were from a very upper socio economic group they were seen as the ideal couple in fact for the first uh, 10 15 years of their married life so uh, there were a lot of societal compulsions also for i'm just you know giving a sort of a case like you know to elab- elaborate so in this in such a case obviously we need to deal with the you know the distressed spouses anxiety depression uh over time they do come to deal with the reality of the situation that there's always going to be grief over the loss of the relationship uh as it was or as they thought it was in the you know in the initial part of the marriage uh but i think it is about forging another bond with the individual concerned so it is almost like you know like at some stage even if it is not it may or may not be a sexual relationship but it could be at least a platonic relationship where they can accept each other as individuals you know who are cohabiting or living living together for whatever reasons i mean it could be for the children or whatever so i think that is the process that we as mental health professionals should actually support them in so without coming off you know like it's it could be very easy for us to say that you know why don't you all separate and encourage them to actually lead a much more you know what we would probably see as you know more fulfilling lives as independent individuals like in this case the lady was uh, educated and could have lived alone also so it was not that you know that she was very dependent but i think it is about uh, we looking at what the couple as a unit needs also so i think we need to support them in that decision and treat the distress that is there because in this case as i said it was the the husband who was distressed and the wife was distressed i mean he was not he was pretty comfortable with what he was so Yeah. those are the issues that we have to take at an individual level right uh, well i yeah yes yes prasant can i just add something quick yeah yeah um i have heard of uh, many cases where uh, such a case goes to a mental health professional or sometimes even a lawyer and then they you know go to a mental uh, marriage counselor and all um the typical uh, thing that happens is that a gay man is married to a woman so woman is the victim and many times people uh, have told me stories where the mental health professional was actually very um unkind to the gay man i have conducted a study uh, where i took very detailed in depth interviews of uh, around i think 11 or 12 married gay men and it was heartbreaking the summary is that uh, both of them are victims of this marriage a gay man has been possibly forced into that marriage or was unaware Uh, there are people who told me i didn't even know that not getting married is an option you know so without victimize uh, considering one person as a victim as dr jyoti said we and allah said that we have to look at it from a whole relationship point of view societal aspect and work on it from their both points of view. yeah uh well i will now come to a very important question uh which uh, i think is important someone has mentioned about us having these sessions in schools sheril mentioned it earlier jyoti ma'am mentioned it yes we we should have it uh, i remember when we uh, myself and dr chawda and others we decided to have these sessions we were met with a little bit of reluctance but then we incorporated it into the sex education session and took it and in fact uh, the 9th and 10th standard students knew far more about Uh, you know lgbtq plus and all the terminologies then probably you know we thought they would know so that was something which is there now uh, this is a question which i will of course address to sheril and nishta and uh, since nishta works with a lot of students and sheril uh, also does a lot of school work in schools very often you know we get a 9th standard or a 10th standard or maybe a 11th standard 
boy or girl that comes to us and says that you know i think i am either gay or i'm either lesbian or i'm queer or i am uh, having this so now generally you know the premise as mental health professionals we've always been taught is that yes we don't discourage them we don't sort of you know say anything negative but we tell them let your sexuality develop let's you know you cross 18 19 20 see how it goes and then whatever is your orientation you you know go with that that's what we generally tell we we do not diagnose an orientation or label an orientation at 14 15 and 16 so the key issue is if an adolescent comes to us with the fact that you know i am i believe my orientation is so and so what would be our advice one you first schedule as a mental health professional and then nishta in general yeah yeah uh, you know i i agree with what you are saying abhinash and actually i think in the recent you know so many years of practice in the recent uh, two or three years i've had so many adolescents coming up you know uh, 9 and 10 graders who say that you know and they come out to their families and the families you know i think i'm bisexual uh and when we kind of try to probe and i like this one individual who said that i'm gender fluid uh when many of them come up with the idea of being bisexual uh and they really have to probe that over a period of time so i tell them that you know we understand this and you know from what are you uh feeling this is your orientation because you have not had sexual encounters you have not had an opportunity to you know explore your sexual orientation many a times it's also uh unfortunately because of social media that they hear some things and sometimes they feel it's cool to be bisexual and it actually it's not that is that their real orientation or it's cool to say that i'm gender fluid because i think at this adolescent age group a lot of attention from your peers saying something that makes you stand out so these things are also factors that we have to uh, look into when a person comes and says my sexual orientation is different from being heterosexual so we have to give them time and say i'm here for you i'm here to kind of guide you and help you through this orientation let's not label ourselves now let's see where this is going as we grow older and then we kind of decide what do we want to do about it yeah nishta well i agree with dr sheril um i have a different approach to this particular uh, situation where i identified having students in my classroom who would come and discreetly share their experiences of being a queer individual uh, my approach would be being available to them whenever they need uh, be it on messages or on calls or however in my best capabilities whatever support i could provide to them um, be there and just listen to them uh, it makes a difference uh, for queer individuals uh, to share how they are feeling because their experiences are not something which somebody else who they would know have uh, you know had in their lives so being available and giving a listening ear works and as they progress um, they start realizing that there is a way through which they could explore well it could be possible digitally uh, by knowing about queer community or you know there's a lot of content available also they try to relate and they try to understand whether is this something that i want or can this be something else so to discuss they need somebody who belongs to the community when i say that it is important because their lived experience also contributes uh being a trans person a lot of people approach me saying that no i think i'm a trans person well i tell them only one thing nobody else can decide things for you you have to decide things so give it time give give time to yourself and try to understand that there's nothing wrong in being the authentic self of yourself but take time there might be a possibility that you might think that you are something else than what you think at this moment well like i mentioned gender is fluid and a lot of people may feel that this is the thing so they would say no this is the thing but after some time they may say no this is not my thing so until and under, unless we don't understand our own self we don't accept ourselves completely we just don't have to jump on to conclusion is something which i recommend people and once they are comfortable within their own skin they are just out and open to the world and comfortably they lead the world as they want to yeah 
Uh, Pallav, your hand is raised. You want to yeah, post? That's yeah, right. yeah. I, I just said uh, I wanted to bring out some programmatic work which we have done with schools. Now, like uh, you all mentioned, it's difficult to actually address sexuality and gender issues sometimes with children because schools are uncomfortable with that, and rightly so. Sometimes below eighteen, they don't want to get into problems with the parents of the children. But what we realized was. Uh, some of the ngos were yet seeing bullying and same sex behavior amongst the slum children or even within the schools so one of the ways of addressing that was at least sensitizing the board of the school as well as the teachers and the counselors within the schools who had no idea about how to handle gender related issues or same sex related issues so in case a case does arise in school or a issue of bullying or something happens in school or some you know sexual bullying happens in school the school counselor and the teachers the principals or the board is equipped to handle that situation sensitively you know right. rather than they being a blank slate so i think even as a starter i think the ability to at least train the teachers and the counselors and the board of the schools is something that you know i feel the psychiatry societies can do as a program in the future correct uh, well i that now brings me to my last round of questions and these are going to be questions addressed to each of y'all uh, i would request you all to spend not more than 1 minute answering these questions because it's more like a breezer round of questions uh, i'll start with you jyoti madam i mean we always been addressing the issue with regard to gay men who are you know with their problems what do you think are the psychological issues faced by lesbian women one is that we don't get so many lesbian women who seek out help uh, what mostly who i have seen is like you know we uh, we get them as partners of uh, transgenders and the ones who with gender dysphoria who are coming for uh, you know gender affirmation intervention so the partners will come with them uh, they have been in a lesbian relationship and then you know the one partner has obviously had gender dysphoria for some time and then decides to uh, you know sort of go through the intervention and usually it's young adults so but then primarily so and what i have seen is that most of these partners are very quiet they would not probably be talking much they will be very supportive but they will be in the background so it is you know primarily the individual with the gender dysphoria who will be actually sitting and talking but apart from that yes what we have seen i mean the few patients i mean the uh, who have come with depression not so much of substance use but depression yes self harm at least ideation with thing i think what happens is with uh, with uh, lesbians uh maybe they you know because of a society they could get married they are forced into marriage they probably come to become aware of themselves pretty late now of course there are lots of adolescents who are coming out who are coming out they are aware they are much more aware in fact what we have seen is in even in our undergraduate training programs uh, the first years always know all the terms and all the terminology right. they we don't right. need to really educate them much Sure. while the pgs are the ones who need the education correct correct you know? yeah, uh, at yeah. least 10 years ahead yeah yeah right ma'am uh nishta key question is that do uh, all transgenders this is a question audience question asked and i'm reading it as it is do all transgenders face gender dysphoria or is it limited to the intersex group well dysphoria is not a word anymore it is replaced right. with incongruence uh, most of the transgenders yes uh, transgender people we do face um uh, in congruence and it is not just the transgender folks but also intersex folks who experience intersex uh with the gender affirmative surgical interventions a lot of parents happen to get uh the surgical interventions done for young or rather babies who identify themselves as intersex which get becomes problematic for them for the future survival uh, there are a lot of hormones which plays uh, which plays ma major role in our body and it is up to the person to decide in their growing ages to decide whether which binary they want to choose or if they don't want to choose any binary if they want to identify themselves as a transgender person it has to be allowed unfortunately our society was not very well equipped with this hence there have been a lot of difficult situations that uh, trans folks as well as intersex person had to face uh, now that a lot of people are keeping ourselves informed and with sessions like uh, these uh, 
psychiatrists are taking interest to know more about the transgender community and the intersex community. I have been through uh, interactions with the doctors where they've said, I have not been exposed to a transgender body. Ne never in my anatomy lectures I was shown a transgender body. How does it look? Well, it was a shock for me. It is not a transgender body, but what she was trying to refer was an intersex body. So I could connect the dots and understand that what the doctor was trying to tell me was about an intersex body. That's where, you know, I could help her understand about uh, the queer terminologies and the difference between a transgender person and an intersex person. But yes, uh, incongruence is very common and most of us experience it. Right. Uh, well, Pallav, a uh, question for you is, uh, what do you think are the few innovative programs, you know, we need to do for the future to, you know, help uh, members of the community from a mental health perspective? Reach out to politicians and start right. talking about policy changes and not just panel discussions. We need that right. sense of society will change. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, a uh, uh, question for you, Prasad, is since you've been doing this whole coaching program, uh, you know, one is uh, how important do you think is resilience building from your end, you know, in this whole area and uh, uh, particularly for a post COVID era, you know, what, what do you think you would suggest? So resilience building is important for all of us, irrespective of our gender and sexuality and gender expression. And especially for the LGBT community, because there is a lot of minority stress that is being uh, pulled on to them. The question is, how do you build that resilience when from a very young age, from a, you know, maybe even an adolescent age, you are told that you're not enough, you are a loser, you are abnormal. How do you build that resilience? And I think, uh, as uh, many of the panelists expressed, that the society needs to change. And I want to just bring to everyone's notice that this is society. We are a part of society. So what are the steps that each of us are taking to make that difference, to make that change is very important. It is very easy for us to say society should change. People should build resilience. The question is, what are you doing for that to happen? What are you doing for yourself and what are you doing for others? If you are able to help even one person to build that resilience through your unconditional acceptance of that person, you have changed the society. So uh, directing those questions to yourself rather than to others is, I think, the first step towards changing the society. Yeah. My uh, last question to you, Cheryl, and then before, after that, I have something for the entire panel that I want to share. Uh, one is, uh, uh, do you think that, you know, we become so much online now in this COVID era and the fact that mental health services are available online. Do you think it has made more members of the community access mental health services? Definitely, definitely. So, you know, uh, pre-COVID era, pre-online uh, consultation, you know, to have somebody come to a psychiatric opening, forget from whichever community they belong to, is itself a challenge because it's a stigma, right? You're getting into a hospital. They, sometimes you know, I have families say, hey, can you just remove the name of psychiatrist outside your you know, clinic so they can just come in? So stigma to seek mental health, uh, you know, help is there anyway. Uh, with the LGBT community, it's even more because they anyway feel discriminated against, they feel victimized. Uh, with online consultations, you know, I've had people from remote parts, uh, I've had you know, so many clients from Rajasthan, from Raipur, uh, who have felt that this is a great opportunity to connect to uh, somebody who is uh, understanding their problem. Like we all know, like like you know, we spoke about this about a lot of mental professions who do not are not aware about the different terminologies. They cannot be affirmative or guide somebody who is struggling. So you know, the access to somebody who can understand their problem has really increased. Um, they can you know have the privacy of having the discussion, you know, you can step out into the garden and have an online consultation. So you're not kind of, you know, restricted by space. And so it's really a boon for people seeking out mental health and for the LGBT community, definitely, you know, a big boon. And we're able to really guide them through so many of their problems. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, well, I think uh, one thing which I want to probably ask of this panel is that, of course, uh, I totally agree with Pallav that we need to work at a policy level. But uh, uh, beyond that, I mean, I would want one of the things is that this panel gets back maybe in August and we do one exclusively in Hindi, you know, as we, you know, advice. So that's one. I will get back to you for that. Another thing that I would want to do is that, you know, I would request uh, Prasad with, you know, HPQI and uh, Jyoti ma'am, if Pune Psychiatric uh, Society could join in with us. And, you know, we could come out with maybe a small, you know, booklet on terminology and do's and don'ts for, you know, mental health professionals and everyone, when you encounter someone who belongs to the community, you know, just basic social skills, you know, what you should say, not say, what you should do. This could be a manual that could be at a psychologist table, it could be at, you know, the workplace, it could be at a CEO table, it could be anywhere just so that, you know, they, I'm sure there must be manuals already there. I'm not saying that they aren't, but, you know, something we could develop comprehensively based on, you know, our uh, expertise. And I think, you know, uh, if Bombay Psychiatric Society and Pune Psychiatric Society together, you know, take the lead, I always feel, you know, Bombay and Pune are two cousins who are joined by Lonaula, you know, in between. So the thing is, if, you know, we can uh, take the lead and definitely do it, I think it'll be something which will be uh, never done before, at least, you know, uh, from uh, on, on an Indian psychiatric platform. So I would definitely want to take this forward. Uh, uh, we will get back to you, all of you on email, you know, and try and see how we can take this forward. Uh, I want to thank each one of you for taking time out on a Sunday evening to be on this panel. It's been a wonderful panel. Uh, Pallav and Nishta, I'm meeting you for the first time, but it's definitely not the last time. I'll be meeting you again and again. Uh, Prasad, of course, you're always there. Cheryl and Jyoti ma'am are just a phone call away, so that's never the thing. So with this note, I thank everyone who have been with us. We've had nearly up to around 95 people who have joined the panel. The recording will be on the YouTube channel. We'll send each one of you the links so that you can circulate it. We haven't addressed everything. We've tried to address whatever we could. There's always so much to address. And uh, with that end, I want to thank you. Uh, God bless each one of you and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.